come to you now from the Washington State Archives, where all details of the state's histories and mysteries remain preserved in perpetuity. Tonight, we venture into the stacks, traveling across the state and through the very gates of time to bring you face to face with Washington's most infamous individuals. Be warned that the program you're about to see contains some of the most wicked, vile, and completely spectacular tales ever told. Proceed with the utmost caution as we endeavor to survive the haunted archives. According to the internet, Trevor Bayless once said, visionaries and dreamers have always been dusted with a little oddity. In the case of Joseph Edward Stanley, it was much more than a dusting. A man with a complicated relationship to authenticity, Stanley packed his ye old curiosity shop in Seattle with treasures and oddities ranging from Northwest art to a dead body once owned by the famous outlaw, Soapy Smith. Stanley's shop still stands as a monument to a life lived weird by a man who could tell a thousand tales. Welcome to Ye Old Curiosity Shop. I'm Joseph Stanley, the founder and proprietor of this unusual establishment. I'm glad you stopped by. You're in for a treat and quite a few surprises. The shop has been down here on the Seattle waterfront since 1899, displaying wonders and curiosities from the farthest reaches of the globe. We have rare gems and minerals from every continent, artifacts from cultures around the world, and of course, natural oddities and dreadful curiosities from the most remote wild places of the planet. Shrunken heads from the cannibal tribes in New Guinea and, and, and the Amazon. And, oh, animals born with, with two heads or, or none. And, and oh, ceremonial weapons for, for sacrifice. <laughs> um, sorry, uh, um, yeah. Um, uh, uh, and, and of course, um, Sylvester the best preserved mummy in the world. Now, Sylvester was a gunslinger in the Old West, and he died out in the Arizona desert in the 1850s. And he dried up so fast, it just desiccated like fruit leather, didn't even have time to rot. Dried up and everything's intact. All the organs, the skin, even his mustache. <laughs> I reckon that if you were to soak him in Elliott Bay for a little while, he'd probably come right back to life. Oh, but, but uh, took a little bit to get to get Sylvester here uh, uh, on my team, but uh, I drive a hard bargain, and uh, here he stands to this day. Now the the strange and macabre is probably what brought you to the shop, and and I do you hope you enjoy what we have to offer, but. Uh, we also have the best collection of Pacific Northwest native arts and crafts anywhere in the world. We have baskets and blankets from Tlingit and Haida weavers. We have, we have totems from the Vancouver Island tribes and, and, and carvings from bone and stone from the Inuit up in Alaska. Yeah, and uh, right after the shop opened, traders from tribes all along Puget Sound started coming to the shop to, to sell their wares. And you know, and no one in Seattle at the time cared for, for these arts and crafts. But now, why, I've had museums and collectors from all over the world who contact this shop to try to procure things for their museums and their galleries and their private collections. I'm proud to have helped to provide an avenue for, uh, for tribal artists to become a little well more well-known and, and to sell their goods. You know, why, even Chief Seattle's daughter herself sold her baskets right here in this shop. Sylvester and I have made uh, quite a name for ourselves here. We've had visitors from all over come to see us. Um, um, Teddy Roosevelt, Charlie Chaplin, uh, John Wayne. J. Edgar Hoover, though I have to say I was not very fond of J. Edgar Hoover. He asked too many probing questions, and frankly, I, uh, I don't like it when men pry into my private business too much, if you understand. But uh, we had, uh, let's see, a uh, Lewis Comfort Tiffany came in one day. Um, as I recall, he bought a, a mammoth tusk. Yeah, I know. And one time, Queen Marie of Romania sat right over there in the Chinese chair. Romania. Mm. Oh, and oh, I will never forget this one time. Catherine 
Hepburn walked right through those doors. Oh, you wouldn't believe it. I mean, I don't get starstruck easily, but oh, I will never forget that day. I mean, Catherine Hepburn. What an actress. Uh, but well, I, I'll let you get on to exploring the rarities inside the shop. Um, feel free to, to look around and, uh, and ask questions. Um, you won't get any answers from Sylvester, but I'm happy to help. And uh, oh, don't touch the shrunken heads. They're cursed. Fame, beauty, a golden voice. Jean Ellington had all the qualities befitting her status as a star of stage and radio, except for one notable caveat. Jean Ellington didn't exist. A decade earlier, as Ruth Garrison, she had fallen deeply in love with a married man in the slow process of divorcing his wife. Never one for patience, Ruth had resorted to a heavy dose of murder to accelerate their separation. After serving time, Ruth reinvented herself as Jean Ellington and embarked on her journey into the spotlight. Once there, however, her facade began to wither under its intense glare, and the ghosts of her sordid past soon came calling. Well, thank you so much for, for meeting me. Tell me, what's it like to be Jean Ellington? NBC's glamour girl. You are the vivacious songstress who warbles a mean contralto. You are all over the airways and in magazines. Well, it wasn't always easy. I went in for a radio audition. I was terrified out of my wits and I thought my career was over immediately. But then I won Eddie Dutchen's radio open in 1935 and ever since then I've been on the airwaves and performing in public and even on film, and I've sung with Ray Sinatra. My goodness, well, it seems like things have been going very smoothly for you. You've been referred to as the girl of the Golden West. So, do you live in the West? Well, I call San Francisco my home. Hmm, what about Seattle? Well, I've performed in many places. Hmm, interesting. So the magazines really love to talk about your beauty and health secrets, but I'm curious about maybe some other secrets. We don't know much about your early life, Miss Ellington. Well, there's not much to tell. I've never even taken a singing lesson. Hmm, I'd say there's so much to tell, like maybe your time in Seattle with Dudley Stores. What? Tell me, are you enjoying your tea? Ruth? Who are you? I know who you are, Ruth Garrison. Oh no. I was there in Seattle. I know what you did. No! Surely you remember Dudley and Grace Stores. I mean, you seduced Dudley away from his wife, my sister Grace, and then you murdered her at the tea room in the Bon Marche. I was there, my mother and I, just a few tables away, when you put the strychnine in her fruit cocktail. I watched her turn white as a sheet and, and collapse, and you went up to her and you held her and, and you, you pretended to be concerned and, and said, are you sick? And then when she became a corpse, you nonchalantly walked away. We saw the whole thing. I was only 17 years old when I met Dudley Stores. I was working at the Seattle Courthouse at the Attorney's Information Bureau. Dudley was a, was a deputy sheriff. He would come to my desk and talk to me a lot. And one night he asked me if I needed a ride home. And after that, we just started dating. But I didn't know he was married. Then till Grace showed up on one of our dates and confronted us. She said that she was willing to give Dudley a divorce. And it wasn't until a few months later that I called her on the phone. I did not plan to kill her. I just wanted to talk to her about the divorce and how it was going. She refused to talk to me on the phone about it, so I invited her to tea at the Bon Marche. After I hung up the phone, I realized that I would have access to her food and that I could put something in her food and make this all go away. 
And that thought crowded out every other thought in my mind, and I knew what I had to do. So, on the way to the Bon Marche, I went to the cut rate pharmacy on Union, and I told the pharmacist I needed to kill a cat. <gasps> he gave me 35 cents of strychnine. I put it in her fruit cocktail before she even arrived at the Bon Marche. I only did it because I loved Dudley. But I paid the price. I went to prison for 10 years. Huh, paid the price? After you were were declared not guilty by reason of insanity, you, you spun across the room and kissed your mother and danced and, and, and went over to the sheriff and said, I'm a nut, ha ha. And then when you were released, you got to live your life as Jean Ellington. My sister Grace only got her grave. So tell me, Ruth, one more question. How are you enjoying your fruit cocktail? Summer 1940. Two fishermen ventured onto Washington's Lake Crescent seeking an afternoon of sunshine, friendship, and the majestic rainbow trout. Before their lines were cast, however, their peaceful sojourn was interrupted by a grim discovery. A body floating in the lake. The frigid chill of the alpine water had kept the body preserved for years, along with clues to the nature of her untimely demise. It was as if she had risen from the lake to tell her tale and bring her murderer to justice. Into the lake of death, I went there. The lake cold depths bound in rope. It's funny how a chill becomes a hug enveloping you. Trust like an animal, wrapped in a gray striped wool blanket, those surplus ones, maybe use them now for moving. It was the rope that finally found my killer, but I knew. Even in my alcohol days stage, I knew it was him. I had a few years to consider what went wrong before I was freed from the deep and discovered. It was a festive time. December 22, 1937, I'm walking along the road, stumbling a little, a tune playing in my head, Silent Night. My green wool dress, so pretty, probably the prettiest I'd ever owned. A far cry from my Kentucky home, walking along a dark black December night. A few stars, but they are hidden by the massive trees around me. The forest here is alive, alive in a way I can barely describe. But I feel safe and warm, maybe a bit more beer and bourbon than I should have, but my night was filled with music and dance and booze. So warm going in makes me feel light, like I'm not stuck with my brood of a husband, Monty. God, what did I ever see in him? We met in a diner, me a waitress. I was drawn to his hands, callous from work, hauling things, mostly beer by truck. Coming through this rather remote part of the Olympic Peninsula, different from the usual loggers, all hands grabbing me. I'm a little fleshier than some of the other girls. I think men feel with more flesh in my bones, I won't feel their groping hands. He walked in one day and nearly slugged a man for laying hands on me. I swooned. No one had ever stood up like that for me before. I was new, just in from South Dakota. My family had drifted west from Kentucky to find work. One failed marriage when I was way too young and now I'm in this remote place. This resort on the shores of Lake Crescent, remote but beautiful. The way the colors of the lake drift from deep blue to gray to a green turquoise. The tall trees stand guard and the hills also full of trees and some days you can make out the mountains of the Olympics with their snow frosted peaks. I do love it here. I did not know it would be my final resting place. When I was pulled from the lake, I'd been here about three years. Disappeared is what Monty said. He said I'd just up and wandered off to Seattle or to Alaska, but Monty ran into my lover, Lieutenant Commander Morse. 
While Monty is gone for months on end, a woman needs a man, protection, love, a warm embrace. I met him in the same way, working at the resort. He came with some friends for a weekend at the lake. They were all stationed in Bremerton and they decided to come out to the peninsula. I was feeling lonely. Monty on the road for nearly a month, a little longer than usual. I had just received news that my father was ill. I was not the biggest fan of my father, but I certainly did not want him to die. And it was my ma. I was worried about how she would fare without him, so I was crying. I thought it was privately, but and out of nowhere, a handkerchief was offered. Ma'am, pardon my interruption in that slow, sly Kentucky accent. It nearly made me weak in the knees. I looked up in this young, Yes, he was younger than me, boyish face so opposite Monty, and I was smitten. We sat and exchanged stories about Kentucky, those hills, the foothills of the Appalachians, the colors of fall, the low rumble of thunder, and well, one thing led to another. Monty demanded I show him who. He knew there were soldiers there from Fort Warden at the party. He cornered me. I'd not expected him to be there. He grabbed my arm, you know the place, right at your bicep, and oh, how it hurt. He swore he'd kill me before allowing me to run off with a soldier boy. I cried. I told him I loved him. I told him I knew about her, that California woman he was seeing on the side. I told him how hurt I was and ripped from his grasp and ran out into the night. As I walked and stumbled along the road, my fury turned to peace as the trees and darkness enveloped me. He was always coming after me out of jealousy, the broken teeth, the bruising I tried to hide, the marks of a woman being manhandled, he clipped me with a beer bottle and knocked me down. No one cared or gave it a second look. And he, one to talk about being faithful. What about her, Eleanor? She seems so pretty. My sister Lois is friends with her. I did not see it happening right under my nose. And then he seemed to add days and nights to his already long trips, claiming he was at a party thrown by one of those beer companies, Heidelberg or Lucky Lager. It was easier for people to believe I up and left I had done it before and then came back. Just disappeared, he said. He filed for divorce in 1938, even put a notice in the newspaper, as if I could read it from the bottom of the lake. I would have granted it. He didn't have to kill me. I'm not sure he meant it. We'd had plenty of these beasts before. But as I stumbled down the road, leaving the party at Cy Garrett's house, he came out of nowhere. It happened so fast. The cold hug of the lake soaked through my blankets, my beautiful dress. I had time to consider how I ended up in this place. They say you know, but you don't. They called me the soap lady. My skin reacted to the deep chill of the lake like ivory soap. He was picked up in LA with her. He thought he was in for bigamy, like he completely forgot that night in December 1937. Maybe it was a crime of passion. His mother was there crying for her son as if he was the picture of an upstanding gentleman. I tell you, he was not. I still feel cold. So cold. Protect and serve, the oath sworn by any officer of the law worthy of the badge. When Prohibition hit Washington in 1916, Seattle police officer Roy Olmsted turned his back on the protect part and focused on serving, alcohol to be exact. Looking to turn Herbert Hoover's great social experiment into a profitable next beer event, he turned his eyes north to the border, where great quantities of Canadian booze sat waiting for an industrious young copper like him. Someone with all the right connections to sneak it past customs and into the eager hands of thirsty Washingtonians. We're closed, unless you know the secret knock.
Welcome to Washington State Archives Underground Lounge. I'm Roy, Roy Olmstead. These illustrious stacks have brought me back to life to apprise you of a tale from Washington history. First, I have to ask you, are you a cop? Are you wearing a wire? Great, now pick your giga water. What's your poison? You want a Chin Ricky, French 75, Singapore Sling, Bee's Knees, Sidecar, South Side? You know what? It's been a hundred years. I don't remember how to make any of those, so just have a whiskey. That's the real cat's meow anyway. Besides, I wasn't a bartender. I was a rum runner. Best in the business, in fact. So, you may call me Roy, but my abiding legacy does bequeath me with the lauded epithet of King of Puget Sound Bootleggers. Now, yes, I said I was a rum runner, but my nickname says bootlegger, and no, they're not the same thing. The difference is that a bootlegger runs liquor on land and a rum runner does it by sea, and I've done a fair share of both. See, 1920, I was still on the Seattle Police Force. My partner and I were down at the Meadowdale Docks near Edmonds, taking a stroll early morning. We come across a big crew of guys unloading a hundred boxes of Canadian hooch off a boat and onto a truck. Now you may think that me being a cop I was there to shut it down, but no siree. That was my crew. This was my show. Unfortunately, the feds had a show of their own plan for that night. They'd followed us down to the docks, they blocked the exit, they came in, they arrested all my men, everybody except my light-footed partner and myself. We hopped in our motor car, and those geniuses, they only blocked the exit. We went right around the exit through some bushes. Well, as luck would have it, one of the feds recognized me, my work found out, and the Seattle police force, you could say, fired me. But that was not the end of King of Puget Sound bootleggers wasn't exactly the beginning either. So I came to Seattle from Nebraska back in 1904. I joined the police force in 07. Come 1914, Washington voters decided to make Washington a dry state. Imagine that, the whole state. Not many people realize that. Washington was a dry state long before prohibition ever hit. So Washington actually got a big jump start on prohibition, meaning they got a big jump start on bootlegging. Problem was, Nobody knew what they were doing. They were making money hand over fist, but the clowns kept getting collared. They would go to the big house because they had no idea. All they needed was somebody to show them what to do. All they needed was a little bit of discipline, a little bit of structure, and a massive amount of bribery. And I was a cop, I was one of the coppers. And so I knew how to deal with their dry squad, mostly a whole lot of bribery. So I started a fleet of boats that ran the British Columbia and back. I had an unlimited source of Canadian hooch that I had no problem bringing back down here from Canada. Now, by the time the 18th Amendment was passed, the feds came around. That's when I got busted. And that's when I got fired from the police force. But that was actually the best thing that could have happened to me. All I got was a $500 fine and a whole bunch of free time. All that free time meant more liquor, meant more business, meant more money. And after a little while, I was running a legit business. By legit, I don't mean legal, but I was the largest employer in the Seattle area there for a while. We were running 6,000 cases of hooch every month and making 200 grand doing it. And we did it all with no guns and no violence. And you wanna know why? Because we didn't need them. Before I knew it, I was rich. Somehow I even became a socialite. I divorced my first wife and I met a beautiful English woman in Canada and married her. Her name was Elise and she was constantly helping me with new ideas about how to get more liquor into Washington. Seattle was knocking them down faster than we could line them up. We went to the Boeing surplus yard, we stole the engines out of their extra planes and we put them in our boats. Those were really loud but man I tell you they were fast. My wife started a radio station that ran in the middle of the night telling kids bedtime stories. We would use that to send secret signals out to our boats and our cars because we had radio transmitters installed in everything. That radio station actually turned into Como News in Seattle. Maybe you've heard of that. All that technology, we can credit that to a man named Alfred Hubbard. Alfred Hubbard can also take credit for the demise of my empire. He decided to become an informant and the feds put wiretaps on all my phones. 
And eventually they arrested everybody. They came into my Thanksgiving party and arrested everybody there, including my beautiful wife, Elise. My case went all the way to the Supreme Court over those wiretappings, because wiretapping is baloney. You should not be allowed to do that sort of thing. But my conviction was upheld and I went to prison. After I got out of prison, I got a full presidential pardon from FDR, real nice guy. But by that time, prohibition was over. So naturally, I became a Christian science practitioner. Police open up. You better run. The passage of time renders all things distant and faded. Memories retreat until they slip through our fingers like so many grains of sand. Were it not for the vice-like grip of the Washington State Archives, stories like the ones you've heard tonight would be lost to history. So as you leave here tonight and return to the doldrums of your daily lives, be ever aware that you yourself could be one misstep or chance encounter away from finding your own story preserved within these walls, waiting to be revealed at the next Haunted Archives.